How you going guys? Ratcon is done and dusted for another year with the 2021 event coming to a close on the weekend and I wanted to take this opportunity to share my results, the opponents that I versed, how my list performed, what I would change and just a general sort of summary of my games over the weekend with you. So without further ado, let's just get stuck straight into game number one. All right, I want to start out by pointing out that this is actually Saturday of the following weekend. So it's been a full week since these games took place. Uh, there's been a lot of unpacking from the event. I'm also in the process of setting up and moving house. So we've still got a lot of stuff to do there. So apologies for the delay. And also apologies if I get anything wrong in this video as I am operating off memory. And it was, as I said, over a week ago now. So with that being said, game one was against Hugh and his Necrons. Uh, now, Hugh's list was uh, off memory. There was a couple units of 20 Necron Warriors. There was a couple of units of Scarabs. There was some Lich Guard. There was some Flayed Ones. There was a Silent King. There was a Catacomb Command Barge. I'll chuck the list up beside us here and I'll uh, highlight it as I go. But um, yeah, off memory, he had a, a pretty competitive, pretty strong Necron list. Uh, and you're all familiar with my list from my previous videos, but for those of you who need a refresher, there was two Keeper of Secrets, a big Noise Marine bomb, uh, two Terminator bombs, um, a Demon Prince, two units of ten uh, Demonettes. That's more or less it. Um, so basically the way this game panned out is it was a table quarters deployment. So I deployed pretty aggressively, knowing that if he goes first I can spend a CP to redeploy myself into safety. So I deployed pretty aggressively. He deployed pretty aggressively as well, thinking that it was going for the dice off to see who goes first. I won that roll, and I was able to move my noise marines up, warp time them in further, and then I had deployed one of my units of terminators on the board. So what I did is that unit then just moved forward and with its long ranged guns, the bolters and the uh, auto cannons, was able to take a couple of wounds off a Necron warrior unit then the noise marines were able to dump a whole volley and delete the unit. Then I fired again with the noise marines, which cleared out all of the scarabs as well. Uh, meanwhile, my two keepers of secrets went straight up the guts. And basically what this did is it meant that all of the stuff that he had in front of his um, characters and all that, the, the warriors and the scarabs was all killed in shooting, which meant the keepers were free to charge in. And then I was able to charge in and kill his catacomb command barge, uh, killed a whole bunch of other stuff and basically the game was over turn one because then in his turn on his backswing he killed one keeper of secrets and that's it so then we went into turn two and my terminators dropped down killed his flayed ones and a bunch of lynch guard the noise rings killed the other unit warriors the keepers killed a bunch more characters and basically at the end of my turn two so he's only had one turn at this point all he had left on the table was the silent king and I still had my pretty much entire army. So at that point, he pretty much just conceded um, and we just sort of talked it out and went, okay, well, you'll go here and then I'll do this and then I'll just basically, everything converges on the Silent King and kills him. So that was a 100 point maximum win, massive start to the event. Uh, great game, Hughes a great guy. I played him a couple of times now. Um, but yeah, unfortunately I just, I had the list advantage and the going first was a huge advantage for me in this game as well. So yeah, nothing I've changed there. Can't argue with a perfect score. On to game two. So game two was against Terence Drew and his Death Watch. Now this was a really, really uh, intimidating Death Watch army to verse. Luckily, my army has been very specifically tooled to killing Space Marines of all varieties. So I wasn't too scared, but looking at the list, I was like, that packs a lot of punch. He had three Redemptor Dreadnoughts, and then he had three kill teams. One of them was a Primaris kill team that had five Outriders, five Intercessors, and then the other two were mixed Proteus kill teams with five Terminators, and then five Storm Shield Veterans, and Cyclone Missile Launchers and Storm Shields and Thunder Hammers out the arse. So these were really powerful units. Um, 
he also had a bunch of characters spilled in through there. He had Jump Pack Libby, I believe. He had a chaplain on a bike. And he had a, a, like a smash captain on a bike. So a guy with a Thunder Hammer Storm Shield on a bike. Um, really, really good list. Um, again, so this time I put both Terminator units in Deep Strike Reserve. Deployed the whole army on the table. Um, and then he won the roll to go first. He also... Uh, he combat squatted every unit because he took while we stand on his kill teams. Uh, so he while he did while we stand and then he combat squatted them all, meaning I had to kill fucking everything to get those points. Um, interestingly, though, when he combat squatted them, the two Proteus kill teams, he split them into five Terminators and five Storm Shield guys instead of mixing the squads, which sort of defeats the purpose of running Death Watch because part of their like charm is that you can have the storm shields mixed in with the, you know... But he didn't do that for whatever reason. Uh, and that kind of stung him a little bit. Um, but yeah, so basically he just frontlined everything as well. And we basically... I more or less frontlined everything. I, I deployed the noise marines conservatively this time. Um, hoping to, if I win the roll off, I was going to pull a sort of a gotcha by redeploying them aggressively. So I was hoping if I deploy them conservatively, he'll deploy aggressively. And then if I get first, I can deploy aggressively and counter him. Uh, but he got the first turn. Um, unfortunately for him, the way he had deployed, he misunderstood one of the pieces of terrain in the middle of the table, which we had discussed at the start was obscuring. Um, but he sort of misplayed it and, and misjudged it. So he, the way he had deployed his army, he, only half of his army could see one keeper and the other half of his army could see the other. So he wasn't able to focus fire one down. So in his first turn, he moved up with the... He beacon Angelus up the bikes and went for that seven inch charge off the chaplain. Uh, but he failed that charge. And then everything else just sort of moved forward and shot at the two keepers, but didn't kill either of them. So it was a pretty lackluster turn one from him. And then in my turn one, the noise marines moved up, warp timed, killed all of his bikes and all of his intercessors and the chaplain and a unit of five storm shield vets fucking noise marines man they killed the fuck out of everything um so yeah they killed all that then one of the keepers went into one of the units of terminators and since he didn't have any storm shield boys in there um he had no ablative wounds so those three damage hits were just cleaving straight through um terminators with every attack um so yeah, that noise, uh, one keeper went in and killed that. So now he'd lost two of his Wally stand targets in the first turn because I killed the bikes and the intercessors with the noise marines. So that's one Wally stand dead. Then I killed a unit of five storm shield boys with the noise marines and then the unit of five terminators with the keeper. So if he had to mix those squads, it would have been a completely different story because I was firing two damage shots into a two wound thing and then I was able to get a combat that's three damage into a three wound unit. So I got exactly what I wanted to do. Whereas if he had mixed them, he could have made me shoot my two damage shots into a couple of three wound terminators, which would, would have made, taken a lot longer to kill him. Uh, but he didn't. So that was uh, good luck on my part, him making that mistake. Uh, but yeah, so killed two of his while we stands, and then the second keeper went into one of his dreadnoughts, um, one of his redemptors, and did fuck all damage to it. And then on the backswing, it just stopped that keeper. And at this point, I was like, okay, well, I've I've hurt him very very severely, but those redemptors are really really tough. And then in his turn two, he went and killed my other keeper, killed a ton of noise marines. And now I, I sort of had nothing on the table because he killed my, most of my noise marines, killed my, both my keepers. Uh, I was a little worried because I was like, even though I had this, this explosive first turn, I don't really have the tools left to actually punch him dead. Uh, but luckily my Terminator bombs did exactly what they were designed to do. And that's that they drop down, they shoot twice with the melter guns, which is really effective at taking out things like dreadnoughts. That's what they're in the list for. They're, to deal with all this, all the neg one damage stuff that's everywhere these days. Um, those melter guns do a really good job of killing that. And then from there they charged in 
and killed his remaining kill teams and he was done. So that was another really big win against the matchup that if he had played it differently, I think he could have actually got the edge up on me. I'm surprised that he didn't put any of his kill teams in deep strike. I'm surprised that he allowed me to shoot his kill teams with my noise marines. I would have thought that he'd put, knowing that my terminators can't come down till turn two, I would have thrown the Redemptors at me, knowing that the Noise Marines can't kill a Redemptor. Like, and the, the Keeper of Secrets, even they didn't kill the Redemptor, and then the Redemptors killed the Keepers. So I would have probably reversed it and thrown them forward. Um, but it could have gone very differently had he made the charge with those bikes, because that would have allowed him to charge and get out of line of sight of the Noise Marines, which would have meant that they would have been a pain in my ass in the backfield. It could have gone very differently if some dice had gone differently. But uh, yeah, all, all in all, very good game, very good. Um, Terence did a great job, so unfortunately it just, just wasn't his day. It was mine. So yeah, on to game three. All right, game three was against Elliot Poynton's Orc Horde, and fuck me, this was an intimidating matchup. Um, we basically, we both knew going into this that it was going to be, once again, whoever goes first wins. Um, a few of the other matchups that I've played, I feel like my opponents misplayed in deployment or in the decisions they made during the game, which allowed me to get maximum utility out of my Noise Marines turn one. Um, however, with this matchup, if Elliot went first, he had two Burner Bombers and then a fuck ton of boys and some mech guns. Uh, his burner bombers could just nuke the noise ring bomb and now I really struggle to get through the 120 odd orcs that he has on the table uh, meanwhile those mech guns are really good at killing keeper of secrets because they don't wound against your toughness which means my neg one to wound rolls doesn't really help um, so yeah it was an intimidating matchup I knew the only way I could do it was to spread out as best I could so that his bombs don't kill everything um, and then just go hope for turn one and go aggressive. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. I got first turn. I was able to move up. The Noise Marines killed 60 Orc boys in that first turn. And that's through their five up invulnerable save and six up feel no pain. I just went, <laughs> killed 60 of them. Um, but his bombers were out of, out of my range. So I couldn't interact with them at all. Uh, then in his first turn, his, his bombers flew over and nuked almost all of the Noise Marines dead and also did a bunch of mortal wounds to a bunch of other stuff as well. So he did the um, flying headbutt with one of them, which is a self, like a suicide bomb that um, takes out a bunch of stuff. So he had one plane left. And then in my turn, I was like, okay, I need to kill that plane because I can't let him flying headbutt me again because doing flat three mortal wounds to everybody within six inches is insane. So I dropped one of my Terminator units down fired twice with veterans of the long war and prescience and still didn't kill that fucking plane um so luckily i had a little bit and i also threw some smites into it as well like i really went hard on this plane and it was just ridiculous like all my melter guns missed and then i'm like okay fire again all my melter guns missed and i'm like jesus this plane uh but i got there in the end i did kill it um and then I sort of just closed in on him as his boys were sort of evaporating um, and ended up getting another, I think it was a 96 point win there. Um, yeah, Gaz Cole was a bit of a threat, but I think that Elliot maybe underplayed Gaz Cole. He sort of played him conservatively defending the back line, whereas I would have just thrown him forward and used him as a bullet sponge. Um, and the other thing that I think Elliot did possibly... Uh, regret was he deployed all of his boys on the table and because he did that he had to deploy them forward because there's so many he couldn't tuck them in a back corner and that meant that me getting first turn I was able to warp time up and then kill two units of boys whereas if he had put those two units of boys in reserves that would have meant that he could have put the other unit of boys on the table out of my range which would have meant that whether I get first turn or not is irrelevant because I can't interact with those boys. And then he can just bring them on. If he wants them in his backfield, he can just bring them on his backfield later. You don't need them there on turn one. 
Sure, it would have cost him CP to do so. Um, and it would have also meant that if I had gone first, I'd have two turns to get all up in his shit um, without him having those units there to retaliate. But I feel if he'd have done that, we could it could have been a little bit more of a complex game where he could have then gone, okay, if I've gone all up in his shit, well, he could bring his boys on in the backfield and now I have to turn around and go back, which my army's not very good at doing because it's not that fast. Um, so he had, a, he had some options there. I feel like he sort of used his standard template of how he fights everybody. He used that against me when perhaps he should have thought outside the box a little bit. Um, but yeah, all in all, I was really happy with the way my list performed in that that matchup. So no complaints here. Uh, I wouldn't change a thing. And then we go into day two. So first game of day two was against uh, Boyd, I believe his name was. He had a Space Wolves army. Fucking legendary bloke. Had a great game with him. And it was one of the most strategically nuanced games I've played in a long time. It actually kind of reminded me of the old Death Star on Death Star matchups. Because basically he had Thunderwolf Cavalry, he had Bjorn, he had Murder Fang, he had a Wolf and Dreadnought with Storm Shield and a big fucking axe. He had a Wolf Lord on Juggernaut, oh, not, not on Juggernaut, on fucking Thunderwolf. Um... And then he had uh, an Impulsor with Blade Guard, a Judicia, uh, a unit of Fenris and Wolves, and a couple of units of Grey Wolves, Grey Hunters, whatever they're called. Um, so it was just basically, it was a really combat dense, real, oh, and a Redemptor as well. He had a Redemptor as well, because everybody has Redemptors these days. Um, yeah, it was a really, really combat dense combat heavy list that's also really fast because a lot of that stuff has access to advance and charge a lot of it has like really deep threat range so um knowing that if he charges me and fights first he's going to kill me but if i charge him and fight first i'm going to kill him we basically played this game where during deployment i was measuring his maximum threat range say he's got a 28 inch threat range on the Thunderwolves, I was deploying 26 inches away, you know, or 27 inches away. And I was like, okay, if you want to try and charge me, you're going to need to roll an 11. Um, just shit like that. So I was trying to bait him into going for the charge and then failing, which would then mean he's in my threat range in my turn so that I can charge him. But he was doing the exact same thing. <laughs> so we were just sort of circling each other. And it felt very cinematic like the way that wolves would circle their prey kind of thing it was fucking sick it was mint um but basically my army had something that his didn't and that is really oppressive shooting and the ability to deep strike and then charge so the first couple turns we played this little dance but then my army was just like you know what i'm sick of dancing let's fight and there's not much he could really do to stop that. So the Terminators dropped in. I dropped one unit in and I killed his Redemptor and Murder Fang. And then he charged a bunch of other stuff in and he killed all that as well. And then the second unit of Terminators dropped in and killed the um, Blade Guard Vets, the Judicia, um, the Wolf and Dread, or it might have been the other one, one of the character Dreadnoughts. Uh, the Librarian, he had a Librarian with Jump Pack. So the, the Terminators did almost all of the heavy lifting in that game. Uh, I did a cheeky little, <laughs> little move where I deployed my Noise Marines on the table so that he would head in their direction. Uh, but they were on the ground level of a ruin that was like seven inches tall. So then as he got closer, I just moved and then warp timed up to the roof. And because almost everything in his army was either... Uh, cavalry or vehicles they couldn't get up there to fight me and because it was more than five inches tall he couldn't just go base contact with the bottom of the building and fight me so he moved around this side of the table hunting me and then I just sprung a trap on him and went up to the roof and then noise marines just shooting down with their um, sonic blasters killed the fucking killed tons of shit so that was a fun little uh, fun little trap that I set for him and he took it hook, uh, hook line and sinker uh, what else was cool in that game um, I think yeah mainly it was the Terminators did most of the heavy lifting 
uh, once he sort of broke formation because he had to because he realized the Terminators are down this is happening you know he broke formation and then it was sort of his army kind of fell apart because he, now he had characters that weren't being protected by screens, which means my noise marines, like, they blew up his uh, Thunderwolf wolf Lord, um, like, because that guy had come out to try and do stuff. So, yeah, it was, it was a really interesting game. The first couple of turns took, like, like, the three-hour rounds. I reckon turn one and two took about two and a half hours. <laughs> because it was just pre-measuring everything, asking questions, making sure that everything was understood and that we're all on the same page. Um, but then once we got into turn three and he realized, oh shit, these Terminators are all up in my shit and there's nothing I can do to stop them. He realized that even though he can pre-measure my charge range, he can't stop a deep striker. And because of the way I positioned my units and the way he was moving, he was actually exposing... He was sort of trying to block the punch with his face, you know? He had these little screening units at the back, like he had his uh, Fenrisian wolves at the back. He had his uh, Grey Hunters at the back so that he could move the bulk of his army forward and I couldn't deep strike behind him. But basically what that meant was that once I've dealt with the Impulsor and the Blade Guard vets, um, he had nothing in front of him. So then the next drop was just killing characters, just killing all of his characters. Um, so yeah, really fucking interesting game. I had a ton of fun. It was it was one of the highlights. It reminded me very much of the old 6th and 7th edition Death Star matchups where you'd sort of dance around each other, daring the other person to make that charge. Um, so yeah, that was, a, that was a ton of fun. Uh, and then my final game, this is round five. Uh, this game... I played against Matt Morisoli, who, in my humble opinion, is probably the best 40k player in Australia. He's absolutely fucking dominating the tables at the moment. He has been for a long time. He's shown consistent results for a very long time. And he's one of those people that can just pick up any old faction and kick ass with it. And that's why I say he's one of the best, because there's lots of really good players out there that are getting equally good results, but they seem somewhat bound to a specific faction. So I put myself in that category. I pretty much only play Chaos. You try and put me on an Eldar list and I'm not going to know what the fuck I'm doing, right? I have a very specific play style as well. I have to be on a really aggressive list. So that's how I play. Even though the Space Wolves game was a test to myself to see whether or not I could play that cagey kind of game. But generally speaking, I'm playing hyper-aggressive. That's what I do. Um, whereas Morisoli, he can, he can play all types of lists, he can play all types of styles, and he always just gets the results. So, um, I've got massive amounts of respect for him as a player. Um, he was playing Dark Eldar, brand new. I haven't read the Dark Eldar Codex, I haven't read any Tactica articles on it or anything, so I literally had no idea what this army does, but I know that it's being piloted by one of the best. So I'm like... At the very start of the game, I was like, fuck, this is, this is going to be rough, right? Um, and then I basically proceeded to make big mistake after big mistake that cost me the game. So his list, um, like I said, I don't know Dark Eldar well, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fuck up his list. I will post it on the, on the screen. But um, he had basically like six or seven raiders, um, a bunch of witches, a bunch of incubi, a bunch of Hellions, and then a bunch of murderous characters. Um, and he'd come over to my house the other day, before a couple of days before the event, and showed me what one of those characters can do. And one of his, like, succubus can comfortably kill all 20 of my Terminators in a single fight phase. So I was just like, fuck, these... And, and then he's got all these dizzies, which are amazing at killing Terminators, amazing at killing Noise Marines. Like, I was like, this is going to be a fucking rough matchup. He's also got MSU, so he's really good at screening and blocking and stealing objectives and denying primary. So I'm like, this is going to be the hardest matchup of the event, no doubt. Uh, but in retrospect, I think I could have won it. And I think if we played it again, I would absolutely win because I've I made a few really huge mistakes. And when I look back on them, if I'd done them differently, I uh, it would have been a different result. So basically, here's how the game went down. Um, I was worried that if he went first, 
and I put my Terminators both bombs in deep strike reserves, he would just spread out and cover the table, which would mean that my Terminators wouldn't be able to come in. And he had more than enough movement and more than enough disposable units to do this. He could have just put little units of crap in his backfield and then just threw the boats forward. Empty boats, who cares? And then those Terminators all just die. And I was like, I can't do that. Those Terminators really need to pull their weight in this game. Um, so what I did was I deployed both the units of Terminators and the noise rings. There was enough cover that I was able to hide them all turn one. And my thought was, if I have have them all hidden and throw my keepers forward, he then has to come out to combat the keepers, and then I can come out and combat him because I have another another wave, so to speak. Um, but it turns out the Terminators are just way too slow and too short of a range to actually do anything impactful. And also, one of the main things that I built into my army, one of the main design elements was that it has three bombs, each, with, each of which I have the CP to fund to shoot twice with and have veterans of the long war. So the idea is turn one, the noise marines go up, they shoot twice with vets. Then turn two, terminator bomb drops down, shoots twice with vets. Then turn three, another terminator bomb drops down, shoots twice with vets. That's built into the list, that's the plan. But deploying all three of them, the problem that with that was that if I move forward one and shoot twice with it with vets, the other two, their shooting is just crap in comparison. Like, whereas if they were in reserves and I was able to sequence those drops, it would have been a lot more powerful. Um, and also the thing that I didn't realize is the last time that I played against, I was a Harlequin's army that did this to me where I had units in deep strike reserves and they just fanned out over the table so that I couldn't drop. I didn't have a noise marine unit that time. And the thing is, is that noise marine unit, when I deploy that in my backfield where he can't see it, he can't just fan out and take over the table. Because if he does that, if he goes first and does that in his turn one, in my turn one, the noise marines just move out and kill like six or seven boats. You know? And if he just waits till turn two, I just, I just wait. And the turn before, because he has to go first, when he does jump out, I can try and jump out and blow him up. So I underestimated the noise rings, which was a mistake that every previous opponent made. And in this game, it was a mistake that I made is that I should have used the noise rings to, I should have put the terminators in deep strikes and dared him to try to screen them out. And if he tries to screen them out, I use the noise rings to punish him. That's what I should have done. Um, but yeah, I was just I was a little thrown off by uh, unfamiliar codex that I've never read, never haven't played Dark Eldar since forever, um, and also knowing that he's one of the top players in Australia, I was like, he's gonna have so many fucking tricks, and he and he absolutely had been thinking about my list and how to beat it, because he knew it was going to be one of the top lists at the event. He knew that it was going to be something that he would have to verse at some stage. Um, Especially like when every every round I go over to his table to, to catch up with him, see how he's going, and he's like, "You finished already?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I tabled him like two turns, you know." So he knew my list was claiming skulls, and it was doing it really well, really well. So he would have been thinking about it, whereas I made the mistake of just not really thinking about it. I was taking the event quite uh, quite a lot more casually, like you would have seen in the video that I posted when I was discussing my list and my strategies. I was more or less saying that, you know, if I go three and two at this event, I'm happy. I'm not here to win the event. I'm not here to take it too seriously. It's more or less a weekend away with the boys with an excuse, which is playing Warhammer. Um, so unfortunately, I went into the game with that sort of casual vibe, uh, whereas he went in like red. He was hot. He came in, one of the first things he did was slam a chess clock down in the center of the table. And no one else had chess blocked me yet at this event because I'd been finishing my games in like fucking an hour and a half. Um, so, yeah, straight out the gate, I was like, okay, he's he's dead serious. I'm not. So, and there's nothing wrong with being dead serious. Mad respect to him. Like, that's one of the reasons that he's one of the best because he key is serious. And one of the reasons that I often don't get the results that I perhaps could is because I just don't commit to being that serious, you know? Um, but yeah, it was one of those games where, you know, like I deployed and then 
in, the, in I think I went first yeah I went first and did nothing um, and then he went first and in his turn his first turn sorry he moved forward and then in my turn two I moved forward did a whole bunch of damage killed a whole bunch of his boats uh, and then he's like dead keeper dead keeper and then the hellions flew in and just destroyed the noise ring bombs hellions can fuck right off they're so powerful um and then yeah basically it was just over from there so it was one of those games where I looked at it and I was like you know what I fucked up my deployment I fucked up my overall game strategy I went into this game half cooked I hadn't done the required prep work and that's cost me the game if we play again I'm pretty sure I've got him beat because I'm pretty sure I've learnt my lesson there and I know I've got a few ideas that I think will uh, result in a win but you never know it is Matt Morosoli and it is Dark Eldar so he's got lots of tricks at his disposal and I'm sure whatever trick I throw at him, he has a counter trick lined up. So I actually will try and tee up a game with him at some stage when he gets back from Brisbane, which is where they are right now. Um, but yeah, so that was my fifth game, which was a loss. Yeah, I st- it was a relatively high scoring loss. I think I got like 50 something, 60 points out of that loss. Um, which is not too bad, Um, but it did cause me a loss. So basically what that meant was that overall I placed third when you only consider battle score. This event, as you'd know from my previous videos, had a paint score and a sports score component. I got maximum sportsmanship points, um, but I didn't max out the paint score. So if you include paint score, I think I came seventh, Um, but based off purely off just battle points, I came third, and the only people above me were the two undefeated players, Morisoli and Adam Napier. Um, so yeah, I'm still fu- I'm stoked with that. Being the being third place, being of all of the people that went four and one, being the guy that got the highest score, that's that's good. And like I said, I was only hoping for a three two maybe. Um, so getting a four and one is amazing, and also knowing that 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 one that I did lose, I probably can win if I don't play like an idiot, um, that feels good. Like I'm very confident and happy with my list. I don't think I would change anything in the list. Uh, Maybe some of the psychic powers on the keepers because currently one of them has the fight as if it's the fight phase and the cut, pick an enemy unit and make them neg one to hit. And then the other one has a negative to your leadership and then a psychic power where a roll off against your leadership. And the idea was is that the one that has the negative leadership, he can also use the Forbidden Gem on you. So I try and neg your leadership, which makes the Forbidden Gem more likely to work. But that just never came up. And so the negative leadership never really felt relevant. And the psychic power where you roll off against their leadership is just bad. So yeah, it just, it just kind of didn't really work, those psychic powers. So maybe I'd go, I'd just double down and I'd give both of them the fight as if it's the fight phase because that way it doesn't matter which one is in that situation they both have access to that power and if they can't cast it like who cares you know um I don't know I'll put some thought into that um the other thing that uh was mentioned by a follower on my YouTube channel on one of my previous videos which I really I really appreciate the uh input was the living whip over the shining ages because the shining ages gives them the six up feel no pain but they can get that from uh delightful agonies so what i might do is swap the shield out for a whip and then put delightful agonies on a keeper and that way he can get his six up feel no pain so he's where he is um but he also gets access to a shooting attack and the keepers of secrets are ballistic skill two I think it's six shots that are like strength six, two damage. It's not a shit gun. Um, and that would give it the ability to, you know, to pop transports, to kill a couple of Terminators over there before charging something else, you know, like it just gives it a bit more utility outside of just being a lightning fast beat stick bullet magnet. You know, it allows it to do some other shit. Um, so yeah, uh, that more or less does it. So. As for the event overall, they did a fantastic job. Ratcon is a, it's always one of my favorite events to attend. The paint score element of it is a little disappointing. I would like to see those separated, um, but I believe that this coming year, 2022, 
their plan is to have two separate events. So one of them will be pure battle, pure competitive, and then another one will be predominantly paint score, narrative missions, that sort of thing. So they're trying to do two different events, which I think makes a lot more sense because otherwise you end up with these two communities batting, like butting heads with each other where one of them wants to just smash face and run most savage lists and then the other players want to run something fluffy and silly and they, they can't play together you know it doesn't work so I think it's a good idea to separate out the events and I look forward to attending both and uh, yeah with that said I'm going to wrap it up if you have any um, comments or if any questions you want to know about the list or the games uh, my opponents anything like that chuck a comment below and also chuck a comment below because this being my first uh, full series of tournament review where I've done the review of the player pack, the review of the missions, the review of my list pre-event and then the review of the games post-event. Let me know if there's anything else in there that you'd like to see in future um, tournament reviews because I will be planning to do these sorts of videos for each tournament that I attend and I want to make sure that I'm providing you guys with the best, the best most engaging content that I can. So with that being said, I'll uh, catch you guys on the next one. Cheers.